The following is a paid presentation brought to you by Amazing Facts Incorporated. Coming up next on Amazing Facts Presents... Armageddon is the final mobilization of the powers and armies of the world to exterminate God's people. For over 40 years, Amazing Facts has been dedicated to sharing God's Word through media. This program features highlights from some of our best television broadcasts. We invite you to sit back and enjoy this edition of Amazing Facts Presents. Today's presentation is an excerpt from the Everlasting Gospel video series. Today we're going to be talking about the Battle of Armageddon. And it is a... Um, a topic of theology that has been debated ever since the words were first penned by the Apostle John about 90 AD. A lot of misunderstandings about the word and, and what the battle is and what it means. Is it literal? Is it spiritual? What is the battle of Armageddon? Armageddon is in the context of plague number six. Very quickly I'm going to overview what the seven last plagues are. Again, this is a whole sermon by itself, but today we're focusing on Armageddon. And don't forget, those plagues came on Egypt just before the children of Israel were delivered from their bondage and began their journey to the Promised Land. The seven last plagues come in our world just before we are delivered from this, the bondage of sin in the world, this whole creation that groans and travails, and we begin our journey to the Promised Land, the mansions He has prepared. Amen? Plague number one is a noisome or loathsome sore on those who receive the mark of the beast. You need to know what the mark of the beast is and who the beast is. Plague number two, the sea, the salty waters become as blood of a dead man. Putrid blood. A lot of people have theories about what that is. Plague number three, the rivers and waters, the freshwater sources become as blood. You remember the waters turned to blood in Egypt. Plague number four, men are scorched with great heat. The ultimate global warming. At that point. Plague number five, the beast kingdom is full of darkness. Was darkness one of the plagues on ancient Egypt? Plague number six, the battle of Armageddon. We'll talk about that in the message. Plague number seven, this is great earthquake, great hail, and ultimately the second coming of Christ. So, now if we're going to study Armageddon, you've got to open your Bible to Revelation 16. We just heard this in our memory verse. Revelation 16, 12. We're going to take this verse by verse. And the sixth angel poured out his bowl. We got another angel here with a loud voice. <laughs> and the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and the water was dried up. These bowls, these vials are the plagues that fall. And the water was dried up so the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. It says to make the way for the kings of the east. Whenever I read that, automatically my mind goes back to when Christ was born. When he came the first time, it's interesting that these magi, these kings, these leaders, patriarchs from the east came. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem. You've heard the song before, We Three Kings of Orient Are. That's because in the original word, they were some sort of patriarchs, magi leaders, chieftains. These were men of honor that came from the east. And they could have been some of the Hebrews that had been left in Babylon. They could have been reading the prophecies of Balaam that said a star would arise out of Jacob. We don't know. But that's one thing I want in your mind when it says kings of the east. The other thing is, from the east represents where the glory of God, the power of God comes from. It doesn't have anything to do with the sun rising in the east. Ezekiel 43 verse 1. Afterward he brought me to the gate that faces towards the east. And behold, the glory of the God of Israel came from the way of the east 
and his voice was like the sound of many waters, and the earth shone with his glory. When King Nebuchadnezzar came, he had to cross the Euphrates, and he came from the east, and he did one of two things with the Israelites. They were either destroyed or they were spared, favored, and taken back to a golden kingdom. Isn't that interesting? When Nebuchadnezzar came, he was the king of that golden empire. One of two things happened to the church when he came. They were either judged and punished or spared, like Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, taken back to a golden kingdom. That's even a figure of what Christ is going to do when he comes to this world. But he crossed the Euphrates. The kings of the east were the Medes and the Persians that came. The Euphrates River dried up. That, what happened when the Persians took control? They issued a decree. The 70 years of captivity was over. The people could go back to the promised land. When the Euphrates dried up, Babylon fell. The people could go back to the promised land. In the last days, do we have a modern Babylon? It's a spiritual Babylon, right? Do we have a spiritual Israel? What don't you know if you're Christ? You are Abraham's seed. So many will come from this east and the west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. If you belong to Jesus, you are Abraham's seed. Spiritual Israel. Spiritual Babylon, spiritual Israel, spiritual Euphrates, friends. Now this sometimes causes people to stumble. Because when you're going through the plagues, is it going to literally be a sore? Yeah. Literal blood? Was it literal blood in Egypt? In the river? Or at least literally red. I don't know if it was literally blood, ocean's blood, literally scorched with great heat, literal darkness. The other plagues are very real plagues. And now when we talk about spiritual Euphrates, here's the key to understand the distinction. All of the terms and the numbers in, in um, Revelation are quite literal, unless you get to a name. Whenever you hear a name in Revelation, you have to apply the spiritual equivalent from the Old Testament story. You get that? Let me give you an example. In the message to the seven churches, out of the blue it talks about Balaam. Was there some guy named Balaam in those seven churches of Asia? No, it was a Jewish name or Mesopotamian name. There's nobody there. But the revelator, or the Lord, wanted us to look back at the story of Balaam to understand what was happening in that church. Then they're talking on and they talk about Jezebel. Well, that was an ancient Jewish queen. She wasn't even Jewish. She was a pagan queen over Israel. Do you think there was a literal member of one of the seven churches named Jezebel? No. It's a name. Revelation, when it says Michael, we know that's a spiritual name. When it says a dragon, that's a spiritual name for the devil. Is the devil really a reptile? All right, so whenever you hear a name in Revelation, there's a key. And that's true all the way through the book, friends. These names, when it talks about spiritually called Sodom and Egypt, those were spiritual names for the na nation of France. You see what I'm saying? So when it mentions Euphrates, it means the spiritual equivalent. Its lifeline is going to be dried up. Then you read in Revelation 18 about Babylon falling, okay? So I hope that makes sense to me. I hope it makes sense to you. Let's go on and read Revelation 16, 13 now. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs, come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. Well, before I get to who those three characters are, let's talk about frogs. How many frogs? Three unclean spirits like frogs. Now, do we find frogs in Egypt among the plagues? A lot of parallels that you're going to see. When you think of frogs, what comes to your mind? First of all, has anyone here ever been bitten by a frog? Oh, come on now. They may have, they may have uh, napped down on you, but frogs have no teeth. But uh, frogs, their real danger is their tongue. The other thing we notice is just when you think you're going to grab them, they leap, they jump from place to place, and they're slippery. These frogs, it represents... And it comes out of what? It doesn't come out of the eye or the ear. It comes out of the mouth. It means it's a message. God's messages are symbolized by angels flying in the midst of heaven. The devil's messages, frogs, because they're, they're reptiles. They're like tadpoles, and they're slippery, and it's, 
It's a, a, a message where they get you with their words. How did the devil get Eve? He stuck out that sticky tongue of his and he, he trapped her. And so it's symbolic of these frogs. Then it says, it comes out of the mouth of the, the beast, out of the mouth of the dragon. And here we've got a picture of the frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon. And then out of the mouth of the false prophet. Well, I want to read verse 14. Sorry, Revelation 16, 14. They are the spirits of demons performing signs, wonders, which go out to the kings of the earth, the governments, the world leaders, and the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Now these are some very important verses to consider. Revelation 13, verse 13 and 14, speaking of the beast power, he performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men and deceives those who dwell on the earth by the means of those signs that he's granted to do in the sight of the beast. There's lying wonders it tells us about. There's going to be counterfeit miracles. That's why our faith needs to be rooted in what does the Bible say, not what great miracle has happened that's on the news all over the world, or some counterfeit Christ that may appear doing wonders, maybe even bringing fire down from heaven like Elijah prayed and fire came down. And obviously if, if uh, Moses prays and fire comes down on the altar, and here this false Christ, he prays and fire seems to come down, that must be true. Signs and wonders. That's why we've got to go by what does the Bible say? And it says to gather them together for the great day of God Almighty. This is often referred to in the Bible as the day of the Lord. That is the day of days, the great judgment day that it speaks of, or the first part of that judgment. Joel chapter 3 verse 2, I will gather all nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. And I'll enter into judgment there with them on account of my people, my heritage Israel whom they have scattered among the nations. They've also divided up my land. Now, you've got to know your Bible. There was a great battle in the days of Jehoshaphat where all of the nations around him took him on. The Edomites, the Moabites, the Ammonites, it looked hopeless. He didn't know what to do. He prayed and God sent him a prophet. God sends prophets to his people just before the end. And that prophet said, don't be afraid. Trust the Lord. And they sent the Levites out before them singing. They were also told to dig ditches. And the enemy, when the sun came up, saw these ditches and they thought it was blood. And they got scared. And somehow they went into battle and began to fight among themselves. And the enemy self-destructed. You listening? The enemy destroyed themselves. They turned on one another. Jehoshaphat didn't have to fire an arrow. God delivered him. So when it talks about the Valley of Jehoshaphat, don't start looking on your map to find out where that Battle of Armageddon is going to be. It's talking about what happened in the days of Jehoshaphat is how it's going to happen again. It's not a place on a map. The Battle of Armageddon is not a battle that's going to take place in a little bitty valley over there in Israel. It is the great battle in the last days between the battles of Revelation are talking about Christ and Satan. It's not a battle talking about Iran, Pakistan, India, these little their nations. It's dealing with those who follow God, the great controversy, and those who follow the devil. Armageddon is the final mobilization of the powers and armies of the world to exterminate God's people like they did with Jehoshaphat. But when that time comes, the tables are turned. It looks hopeless, but God fights for His people. Now I'll say more about that in just a minute. We haven't even gotten to the word Armageddon yet. Revelation 16, 16. And they gathered them together to a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. Now here is the real conundrum. You can't compare this word, really, with the, another use of the word in the Bible because it's the only time the word appears in Greek literature anywhere. At least they haven't found anything yet. And it doesn't really appear as this in the Old Testament. Here you've got a Jewish writer, John, he's an old man, he mostly speaks Aramaic, he's imprisoned by the Romans, a Latin country, on a Roman island, and when he wrote it out, 
the best they can figure, it has something to do with the valley of Megiddo. Har means hill of Megiddo. And so, but that was really um, either Mount Tabor. And it's, it's a confusing phrase. And everyone tries to point on a map, where is this battle? They're gathered to this place called Armageddon. Now, what did I tell you about names in the Bible? Are the names literal or spiritual? They're spiritual and symbolic. So when you read Armageddon, you've got to know where in the Bible does this point. If it's talking about the valley of Megiddo, that's fine. There are three stories in the Bible that help us understand the battle of Armageddon. Judges chapter 4, give it to you quickly. You can read it when you go home. And 5. Children of Israel had wandered from God. They were oppressed for 20 years by pagan country. The Canaanites. And finally God rose up a prophetess by the name of Deborah. Deborah called for Barak. He said, gather all the people together at Mount Tabor. And they fought with the general named Sisera. They had 900 iron chariots. It's like 900 Abram tanks today. They had a massive army. There was no way that they could defeat them. They had been oppressed for years. All of the Israelites have is, you know, garden shovels and things to fight with, pruning hooks. And she says, God's going to be with you. He said, if you go with me, I'll go. She said, I'll go with you. But you're not going to get the credit. The credit's going to go to a woman. Not only did the credit go to a woman, Deborah, but the credit went to another woman named Jael. Because when the Israelites took on the Canaanites in the valley of Megiddo, they were conquered, they were routed, and as they fled, their chariots got stuck in the mire. It had, it had rained, evidently, and Sisera got off and he fled, and he found a tent of um, the Canaanites, which were sort of a neutral people. And he said, look, you know, I, I, you're not an Israelite, you're not one of us, but will you sh show me sanctuary, hide me? So the general hides underneath this rug, and she ends up piercing his ear while he slept, except she went a little too far <laughs> to kill them. And he, uh, she, so she got credit for destroying the army. And then they sing this song. Deborah sings this prophetic song uh, about the victory they received. Judges chapter 5, verse 19. She, the kings came and fought, then fought the kings of Canaan and Tanak by the waters of Megiddo. They took no gain of money. They fought from heaven. The stars in their courses fought against Sisera. She's saying the heavens fought for us. We didn't have to fight. The heavens fought for us and they were delivered. Then you've got the story of Gideon. Now this is especially interesting when you study the word of Armageddon because um, Gideon's name is very similar. Matter of fact, I think I've got, uh, you've got a picture of Gideon up there on the screen, the screen. They were completely outnumbered. Another battle in the Valley of Megiddo. When you read in the story of Gideon, and you go to Judges chapter 7, in the original Hebrew, and go to the next slide here, you'll see this. I want you to see it for yourself. In Judges chapter 7, verse 2, several times it says, God spoke to Gideon, and it's Yehovah Amar Gideon. You got that? Spoke to Gideon. And that's very similar to the word Armageddon. Now in the story of Gideon, you've got the same thing you have in Revelation. There was a threefold power. The Midianites, the Amalekites, the people of the east gathered against God's people and oppressed them. All Gideon had was 300 men, again three. He divided them into three companies. They were all given three things. Given a trumpet, given a pitcher and they had a sword all symbols of the word let your light shine lift up your voice like a trumpet the word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword and at the right moment they broke the pitchers the light shine they blew the trumpet they waved their swords and they shouted and what did the enemy do they woke up in disarray and confusion confounded by the noise the blaring trumpets they saw the lights around the hill they thought there was this vast army and they all turned on each other and self-destructed. That's what happens in the end. God fights for us from heaven in the battle of Armageddon. The Bible tells us Christ comes. Matter of fact, that's the seventh plague is Jesus coming.
Final thing, friends. I just want to go back to Revelation. I'm just going to read it to you so I can tie off this. The seventh bowl. I read about what Armageddon means. Armageddon is talking about, oh, and there, I, you know, I knew I was forgetting something. There's a third story about Armageddon. The favorite young king, he was in his 30s, right about the age of Christ, named Josiah. He dies in the valley of Megiddo, uh, defending God's people. And so whenever you say the valley of Megiddo to the Israelites, it talks about a king they loved who sacrificed himself. You with me? It talks about battles that are won when God fought for them in a miraculous way. And so when it says they're gathered together, like the Valley of Jehoshaphat, the Valley of Megiddo, it looks hopeless, it looks like we're going to be destroyed, but at the last minute, God fights for us. Amen? All the forces of the world are going to be gathered against those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus in the last days. That is the battle of Armageddon. And just when they're getting ready to launch the battle against us, the real forces come from over the hill. You ever seen these stories before where... You know, it looks like this little troop is completely outnumbered and they're surrounded and it looks like it's all over. And all of a sudden you hear in the distance a trumpet. And the cavalry comes riding over the hill just like a, a wave and they come to the rescue and that's what it's going to be like. It's going to be the great rescue. And you know who's going to be leading that cavalry from heaven? Jesus is going to become riding. That's when he comes riding on the white horse wearing his red garments saying the word of God with a sword coming out of his mouth and he comes to deliver his people. And that's when the wicked flee from his presence and run and call for the rocks and mountains to fall on them. So I said I was going to read to you the seventh plague. Verse 17, The seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air and a loud voice came out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, It is done. That's what Jesus said on the cross. And there were noises and thunderings and lightnings and there was a great earthquake, such a mighty earthquake and so great that no Richter scale could measure it. I threw that in. As has never occurred since men were on the earth. That great city was divided in three parts just like the forces in the story of Gideon. And great Babylon was remembered before God. Is that literal or spiritual Babylon there? Spiritual Babylon, yeah. To give up the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath, then every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. So if you're part of the country living class, don't move to Kauai. <laughs> and great hail from heaven fell upon men, every hailstone about the weight of a talent, 75 pounds. And men blasphemed God because the plague of hail was very great. This is the final hail. It talks about the coming of Christ when Jesus comes and raptures up I don't even mean to use that word rapture like in secret rapture, but they are caught up to meet him in the air. And this is the second coming. So, this is what we've got before us, I believe, friends. We, we need to continue studying these things. Believe me, I'm not the last word. I know I don't understand at all, but I want you to understand what I think I do understand and to be prepared. One thing I want you to know is in spite of what's coming, you don't have to be afraid. Don't have to be afraid of the plagues. God makes a promise in his word. You've read this before. We've read it to you in recent weeks. Psalm 91, verse 9 and 10. Because you've made the Lord, the, who is my refuge, even the most high, your dwelling place, no evil will befall you, neither shall any plague come near your dwelling. Notice verse 2, chapter 15, Revelation. And I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire. And those who have the victory over the beast, over his image, and over the mark and number of his name standing on the sea of glass having harps. Someone's going to be on that sea of glass who escapes the plagues. That can be you. I want to be one of those people, don't you? Stay tuned. Pastor Doug will be right back with this week's special offer. It is very dangerous to say, I'll experiment with the world to find out what's going on. What's the best thing for the sons of men to do? Don't live for the flesh. If you live for the flesh, you cannot be alive in the spirit. And if God says, don't do it, 
Don't get married at all. If you don't think you can pick a good Christian, then don't pick anybody. Virtually everyone on the earth, regardless of religion or nationality, recognize that there is some form of battle raging in the world around us between the forces of good and evil. A colossal struggle between light and darkness, truth and error, oppression and freedom, right and wrong, and ultimately life and death. Journey back through time to the center of the universe. Discover how a perfect angel transformed into Satan, the arch-villain. The birth of evil, a rebellion in heaven, a mutiny that moved to earth. Behold the creation of a beautiful new planet and the first humans. Witness the temptation in evil. Discover God's amazing plan to save his children. This is a story that involves every life on Earth. Every life. The Cosmic Conflict. If God is good, if God is all-powerful, if God is love, then what went wrong? Economic collapse, wars and rumors of wars, earthquakes, fear of pandemic plagues. Are we on the verge of Armageddon? Many world religions teach about a time when a great final battle will transpire between the forces of good and evil. Some believe this will be a nuclear conflict between nations. Others believe this is a battle for spiritual dominion of the earth that will occur just before Jesus returns. What does the Bible say about this colossal conflict? And what does it mean for us today? We pray this program has helped you understand this subject. We need you to help us share this message with more viewers. So today, for a donation of $20 or more, we're going to send you an outstanding book on this subject called Battle of Spirits for a gift or donation. Call the toll-free number on the screen and ask for author 1014, or if you prefer, you can simply write us at Amazing Facts, Offer 1014, P.O. Box 1058, Roseville, California, 95678. Or visit our website at amazingfacts.org. Well, that's all the time we have for today's edition of Amazing Facts Presents. Remember the words of Christ, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. This is your last chance to take advantage of this week's special offer. Just call the toll-free number on your screen and be sure to note the offer number when you make your request. The preceding was a paid presentation brought to you by Amazing Facts Incorporated.